uh, saying a pretty lengthy passage of scripture, Hebrews chapter 11. And uh, anyone know what that chapter is called or what we have named that chapter? The faith chapter. Well, she's going to come tonight. I think there's around 40 verses, I think, 40 verses she memorized. She's going to come and uh, quote those for us tonight. So, Rebecca, you come on up. And uh, I'll tell you what, let's give her a hand as she comes tonight. Appreciate her being willing to do that. Hebrews 11, 1 to 40. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned to God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place, which he should, after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Of him it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. 
By faith they passed through the Red Sea, as by dry land, which the Egyptians essaying to do were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of, of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskin and goatskin, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. And of whom the world was not worthy, they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. funny how when they're babies you want to break and then when they turn teenagers you want them back but anyhow it's uh good to be in the house of the lord tonight thank you for coming out on a saturday night and i was a little worried your preacher was talking about a rainbow over the church i think we had a dark cloud over the church i don't know whose fault that is but anyhow it's good to be here we had a good day today he took me to the world's biggest buffet uh preacher heaven i think it was called or something like that what was it shady maple all right uh, we went in Lancaster, and uh, I don't say Lancaster. We have a Lancaster, South Carolina also, and we can always tell when there's folks that have come through from up north because they say, where's Lancaster? And we say, there's no such place. But anyhow, we uh, had a good day today, good fellowship. We've really enjoyed it, and, and I've enjoyed myself. And I thank you for letting me come. And uh, if you're down our way toward uh, Wilmington, please look us up uh, to find our church. You get on I-40. And you take a left at the Krispy Kreme, and our church is one mile on the right. All right, I-40 dumps into Wilmington, and uh, every time we leave town, the sign says Barstow, California, 2,558 miles. And my kids, from, from the time we've been there, when they, were, they said, Daddy, let's go. You know, let's go, and, and uh, one day... Uh, we're going to go, all right, or I'm going to go. I hope it's on the Harley when I ride, but anyhow, we'll, uh, I don't know how we'll get there, but uh, anyhow. So we, and then somebody gave me a picture from Barstow, California that says Wilmington, North Carolina, 2,558 miles, and so I've enjoyed that. But uh, if you come our way, please look us up. We'd love to have you. Um, we've prayed for you guys, and I did years ago when I first met Alan and Jenny. I said, you guys uh, have the personality and the zeal and the heart and the talent Y'all need to go somewhere and start a church somewhere, and uh, I'm so uh, proud of them and thankful for them, and, and, and uh, remember uh, Mrs. Allison, and it's good to have her here serving the Lord too, and, and uh, just uh, thank you for coming. And Miss Rebecca, tonight not only did you do a good job in your memory, but you said it so well, you said it like a lady, looked like a lady, thank you. This preacher appreciates that. I know your pastor's proud of you, and uh, that means a lot. And I could put Miss Rebecca here and show you this is your brain, and this is your brain on drugs, okay? And I would show you, don't do drugs, don't do those things, because I'm sitting there, you know, trying to follow. I can't imagine memorizing 40 verses, all right? But you did good, and uh, the good thing about that, it'll always be with you, and God will use that in your life the word of God. So thank you uh, for that tonight. And then I was thinking when I come in, brother, you showed me the picture. Uh, you say you have some birds. You call them and, and the, the big birds. And I was thinking of a story. I had a guy in my first church I pastored. His name was Tony Broom. I don't know if y'all ever met Tony. He was a blind fella. He played the piano. 
uh, played piano and sang, and real talented guy, and he had an African gray uh, giant bird, and, and I was telling them his bird was a little mean, every once in a while I would get out, and, and somehow before he had got him or something, his, the African gray, I forget what he called him, had learned a couple of bad words. And uh, every once in a while, the bird would, would say a, a bad word, you know, and, and Tony would take that bird and snatch him and take him to the, you know, the refrigerator in the freezer, and he'd stick him in the freezer, you know, and he'd say a customer, he'd stick him in the freezer for like a minute and then pull him out, and, and he'd, say, he'd tell that bird, now, are you going to say any more cuss words or bad words? And that bird would say, no, you know, I promise. And sure enough, a few days later, man, he said another bad word, and Tony took him again and stuck him in the freezer for five minutes this time, and pulled him back out and, and he asked the bird, said, are you going to say any more bad words? And that bird said, no, I promise you I won't say any more bad words. And, and, and I'm telling you, a few days later, he said another bad word and Tony stuck him and stuck him in the refrigerator or the freezer for 30 minutes and pulled him out and said, I'm telling you, are you going to say any more bad words? And the bird said, well, can I ask you one thing? And Tony said, what's that? He said, what'd that turkey do? <laughs> will, you, will you get that? All right. All right. I was getting some mean looks from the bird lovers around. I'm telling you, I had to hurry to the end with that joke, all right? Because it was just going downhill quick. And uh, good to be here. Good to be in the house of the Lord. I'd rather be here on a Saturday night than anywhere I know. And certainly thankful for God and, and uh, for his goodness to us and his grace that's changed our lives and done what he's done in us. Take your Bibles, if you would, First Chronicles 16. Hope you'll come back in the morning for uh, Sunday school and then church tomorrow morning. And I probably will head back uh, tomorrow afternoon um, just to, to get on back home. And uh, I'm, um, I'm old enough that I, have to, I sleep better in my bed. You all know what I'm talking about? Are you all at that point? You know, I used to laugh at my grandmother or my wife's mother. She'd come see us. She brought her pillow and her blanket. You know, now when I travel, I have to take a pillow with me. I don't take a blanket. But anyhow, I have to have my pillow and uh, sleep in my bed. And, and, uh, but First Chronicles tonight is where we're going to be. And, Ask the Lord to use this. If I had to speak a message to my church, and th this would be it. I have uh, sort of made this a theme of our church back there in Wilmington, and our folks are no different than you, and uh, you're no different from them, and, and uh, they just come, they love the Lord, and, and uh, you'd get along with my folks. We like to cut up, have a good time, we like to eat. Y'all do uh, like to eat, uh, I hope, and, and uh, that's a free meal Baptist, you know, they call us, not free will Baptist, and uh, we like to gather together, and, and I tell our folks, you got to eat somewhere, and so we might as well eat together in fellowship, and we enjoy that, but when I think of what a church is and what we should be doing, I think of this passage of scripture that God gave us through uh, David, it's also recorded in the book of Psalms, but here it is, and if we put church in a little uh, short statement and a little phrase. It would be in First Chronicles chapter 16, uh, and it would be beginning in verse 7 and verse 8. Then on that day David delivered first this psalm to thank the Lord into the hand of Asaph and his brethren. He said, Give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, Talk ye of all his wondrous works. Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his marvelous works that he hath done. His wonders and the judgments of his mouth. Let's pray. Father, help me this evening. My heart has truly been blessed. And Lord, as I heard our sister uh, just uh, recite uh, passage of scripture, not to, not only we're amazed at the length, but we're amazed at your word and the truth and the, the great men and women of faith. And uh, God, I think of those that have given their lives so that we might have our Bibles in our hands and understand these things tonight. I thank you for the, the song by our sister, and I do pray tonight we would rejoice in the Lord. I pray this message, Lord, would be for us. Lord, very few folks would think it'd be important to come to a church service on a Saturday night, on a rainy evening uh, here in this town. But I'm thankful for these folks who thought it important. I pray that it would be worthwhile. I pray the Holy Spirit would come and bring conviction or encouragement, whatever it may be. But God, that you would do a work in our lives tonight. Help me to be able to relay this message, Lord. And would you use this tonight? We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's... A little phrase in verse 8 that King David, later David the psalmist writes, 
And he writes three little phrases there. First of all, give thanks unto the Lord. Secondly, call upon his name. Thirdly, make known his deeds among the people. I believe the order of these phrases is important. And I believe tonight that if we started, and it's just a few of us here, and I hope that doesn't, you know, I'm not impressed anymore with big crowds. I used to be as a young preacher and thought it was better to preach to a large crowd, and I do like to preach to people, but I've, I've learned that if God will show up, I'm happy with who I am. I just want to make sure the Lord's here. And, and as I speak this tonight, I hope that God will get a hold of our hearts with this. For I think it, it, the first point is give thanks unto the Lord. If there's a sin in America today, if there's a sin in our churches today, it's a lack of giving thanks unto the Lord. You see, it's not just enough to not curse God or not hate God. Uh, you know, the Bible even says that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. It's not just, a, I said, you know, our jokes are coming in, and so we're going to have some lightning and thunder. I'm going to preach on the judgment of God, you know, and hopefully every once in a while I'll get a little emphasis from a, a loud roll of thunder, and, and uh, everybody, you know, we ought to fear God and reverence God. But I'm telling you, if there's no other reason, every American ought to serve God, or we, you and I, ought to love the Lord, is His goodness to us and His grace to us and, and how uh, good the Lord has been unto us. And David here says, let me tell you something, church. He said, first, First thing we ought to do is give thanks unto the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm one of those guys that every once in a while I have a bad day. Do y'all have a bad day? And, and you might find this hard to believe, but I get grumpy every once in a while. And I, I really have a problem with sarcasm. I have to be careful uh, with sarcasm. Um, and it's not my fault. If everybody else was straightened up, I wouldn't have to be sarcastic and tell them they're dumb, you know. But anyhow, I, uh, we, I have those times sometimes. And, and every once in a while in church, we'll come to church. And maybe you've sensed this. You're in church and everybody's dragging, you know. Uh, things are sort of uh, just sort of dragging. Everybody's had a rough week. Everybody's tired and and. and life settles in on us once in a while. I, you know, I'm, I don't like people that smile all the time. They worry me, uh, you know, and, and everybody thinks, well, you'll just be happy all the time. And, and surely on the inside, we have the joy of the Lord. But there's some things that happen sometimes that bother us. There's some things that weigh on our hearts and minds. And uh, there's some things. But here's what he's trying to tell us here is we, especially, uh, you know what the Bible says, come into his presence with thanksgiving. Uh, when we enter into the house of the Lord, we should be, our minds and hearts should be focused on the goodness of God and be willing to stand up and give him thanks. If I was to stop the service and said, let's have a testimony service, who's got something to thank the Lord for tonight? The truth of the matter is, we could go to midnight or two or three o'clock in the morning and never even come close to the goodness of God to us this very day. And may I say, if God never blessed us in never moment for the rest of our life, we could praise and thank him forever and ever in heaven because of the goodness of God already in our lives. You said, preacher, what in the world are you talking about? about give thanks unto the Lord and on those times that I go to church and I find that our folks are dragging I'll say stop let's just stop 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 music stop a minute all right we're going to start with the letter a and brother Dan Patrick uh, put an article in, uh, years ago in the paper about this he said we're going to start with the letter a and I want you to tell me something you're thankful for with the letter a and we'll shout of letter b and and I've found by the letter K or L or M, the mindset changes, the spirit changes. We're the same people. We're in the same building. We've got the same problems. But instead, all of a sudden, we begin to focus on God and his goodness in our life. And, and by the way, most of our stuff, most of our letters are food, you know, and we uh, talk about them. But, but it doesn't matter. The, the difference is we begin to, we, we've got those things in our life. We don't think about them or focus on them. And I'm telling you, I, I believe if if I was God, all of the daily blessings that he feeds upon us, I believe I would get discouraged or angry at my people to never hear, Lord, thank you for these blessings on our life. We sit down to eat. We don't pray over the food because that's what Christians do. We stop and give thanks for the food. I believe everything uh, that we do throughout the day, it wouldn't hurt us sometimes to just give thanks for the building and give thanks for our car and give, hey, listen, here's when you'll begin to appreciate your back and your health, amen, is when you lose it, you know? And you're not, you know, I, I, it aggravates me if I walked outside and tried to pick up a car barehanded and I hurt my back and I laid on the ground for two days, I could understand. But some days I'll step off the little edge right there and my back will go out and you lay on 
on the ground for two days. And you know, and you learn to give thanks for your health when it's gone many times. And listen to me. You say, preacher, what in the world do we have in our world today? Don't you watch the news? Hadn't you seen the economy and hadn't you seen all the stuff going on today? What do we have to give thanks about? First of all tonight, we ought to thank God for providing his son as an offering for our sins. Paul the apostle, the great learned man, he said it this way in 2 Corinthians 9, 15, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. The word unspeakable, we could use indescribable. I, to thanks be unto God for this gift that he's given us. And Paul, the, the man with the, the, the doctoral degrees and the theology, uh, and the theological training, stood up and said, when I think of the gift that God has given to us uh, on behalf of our sins, there are not words to describe the goodness of God and what he's done for us. And listen, I could say I don't have words to explain it, but Paul, the learned man, said, I'm telling you, if all the language language of the world. I like the way Spurgeon said it. He said, if we took all the words in the human language that have ever been spoken, that are ever going to be spoken, and we combined them somehow, he said, they would still not begin to describe the love of God and the offering of the gift of his son for our sins. Every Christian, every born again believer, no matter what's going on in the world, could stop today and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of God's son. And may I also say every every man, woman, boy, and girl in the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his son to the whole wide world. God gave his son to the unbeliever, to the atheist, to the ungodly. God gave his son while we were yet sinners, Christ died. God gave his son for me when we were cursing him and, and hating him. And we have a program, we had a program down at our church. We've had the discontinued for a little while and it's called RU, Reformers Unanimous. It was a, a addictions program. We reached out to the community trying to reach some drug addicts, alcoholics, anybody with any kind of addiction. And we've reached some notorious sinners in our town and uh, drug addicts and crack addicts and heroin addicts. And I've got a guy, we're getting ready to make a deacon that uh, six years ago was a heroin addict and has gotten saved and his family's gotten restored and, and two fine teenage boys are living for God. and, and, and we had a guy used to come in to RU and, and, and he come in, he rode a Harley Davidson and I like, anyhow, y'all figured out I like Harley Davidson. So he rode a Harley Davidson. He come in, he was a rough guy and tough guy and, and we said, glad to have you. He said, the only reason I'm here is my wife said I got to come or she stole me out of the house. I said, well, we're glad to have you. That's why I'm here too. Come on in, you know. And he comes in and sits down and first night we have a testimony service and he raised his hand and said, I don't know why I'm here. He said, I hate God. He said, the last six years of my life, I get on, sit on my Harley Davidson, I crank it up, and he said, I shoot God the bird and said, I hate your guts, I hate you. He said, every day I do that every morning. And so we said, all right. We didn't know his last name, and, and so uh, his first name was Robert, so we called him Robert Bird. But anyhow, we, you know, we, we, uh, made, we, 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 we loved the guy, and he came. And the next Friday night, he comes again. Comes testimony time, he raised his hand and said, I don't know why I'm here. I hate God, I still hate him. I'm not sure why I'm here. And that was it. Well, about six weeks in, one night after the service, David Welch, y'all know David Welch, uh, pastor's little church called in Turkey, North Carolina, had come down to see our program and was talking to him after the service and, and led him to Christ. He got saved and he, he come back in and now he goes to church with his wife and those things. And, and I think about this, Here's a fellow that every day he'd wake up and ride on his Harley and shoot God the bird and shake his face. I said, I hate you, I hate you. And he realized, he says, I realized that that God still loved me. Hey, have you ever thought about the idea? Why? Uh, what's so unspeakable about this gift? First of all, the greatness and the glory of the gift that God's given us. God searched heaven and found the best that he could, uh, the greatest gift, the most glorious gift, uh, the one without spot. He didn't get the second hand gift and give it for us. He found the best uh, that could be given when I was military pastor uh, in Virginia Beach. We had a military ministry. 
We had a little place the Navy guys could come out and stay and, and get off the base and stay on the church grounds. And it was a good outreach ministry. When I first became pastor, uh, youth uh, associate pastor, I didn't know any better than to stand up and say, hey, we need some couches and some furniture for the, the lighthouse, for the military guys. And, and if you've got one you'd like to donate to us, please let us know. Well, in my two years there, I took off 13 couches uh, for folks from the church. And what would happen is they'd call me, a preacher's daughter understands what I'm talking about, elder sister, all right? Somebody would call me, they'd say, Brother Pad, we love the military ministry, we love the church, we've got a couch, we want to donate for Jesus uh, to the lighthouse ministry. I'd say, okay, I'd get the church truck, I'd drive up to their house, and there it was on the front porch. It'd been on the front porch for three years, they'd had it for 25 years, but it was a good couch, and we wanted to donate it uh, to the Lord, you know? I'm telling you, I took 13 couches off of people's porches, and, and people would say, we bought a new couch, we're gonna give our old one to the Lord. I've got an idea. How about let's give the new, if it's such a good couch still, let's keep it and give the new one to the Lord, you know? And, and, and I just thought about, I'm so glad when God searched heaven for a gift. It wasn't the leftover gift, it wasn't the second hand. He found his only begotten son, the spotless, without sin, the son of God. Don't ever say nobody loves me. Don't ever try to tell me God doesn't love me. I'm telling you, brother, he loves you and I. And he gave himself for us and he gave the best that he could for us. And every Christian tonight, everybody could stand up and say, ma'am, thank you, God, for this gift that you've given to me because of the greatness and the glory because of his sufferings for us. You ever considered what he endured on the cross for you and I? There was no more cruel death in the cross it was a public display of the power of Rome. And they would take Christ, the Bible says in, in Psalms, it talks about his form or visage was beyond uh, that of a man. He did not, he looked like a, a monster, not a man because of the plucking the beard from his face. Putting the, he was a king, so they put a crown upon his head, a crown of thorns. Uh, they took him and beat him with that cat of nine tails. They tied him. They stripped him uh, with shame and nakedness. They would put the cross upon his shoulders. They would walk to the longest route to the place of the cross, Calvary there, to make sure everybody got the message of their strength of Rome and their power of Rome. And the crowds would stop and spit on him and, and curse him as he walked by. He fell under the weight of that cross that day. One Simon of Cyrus. Uh, come and took the cross for him. His sons were Rufus and Alexander, we believe, and, and he bore that cross up the Calvary uh, for the Lord Jesus that day. They would take him, uh, they would literally nail him to the cross member, they would raise him up into place, uh, they would drive the nail through his feet, uh, two nails through his hands, uh, and he would literally, it was a suffocation as he stood there. The reason the Roman soldier come by later to break his legs, as long as he could push up, he could catch his breath. But literally, as he would lose uh, the strength of his legs, it was literally a suffocation there on that day. Some folks believe he was high. Uh, I, I tend to believe he was only a few feet off the ground. You read, is it Psalm 22 that talks about the dogs encompassing me? They, they cursed him. They mocked him. Uh, they stripped him of his clothes. They put the sign up over his head. Uh, he, the king of the Jews, that was what he was supposed to be uh, guilty of. And he endured the suffering of the cross that day. They came by to break his legs he had already given up the ghost that Roman soldier in anger took his spear and thrust it in his side to make sure that he was dead on that day and I'm telling you he endured the sufferings of the cross for my sins and for yours and everybody could stand up here tonight and say I'm telling you I could give thanks unto the Lord because he took my place he, he satisfied the judgment of God. He took that cross that day in my stead. And that's why I say it would be foolish to bear my own sins when he's already borne them on the tree. If I would but believe in the work that Christ did on the cross was for me, was in my place, I can be saved. And everybody should give thanks unto the Lord for the benefits that we receive. He was wounded for our trans, he was bruised for our iniquities, but by his wounds we are healed. By his stripes we are cleansed and, and healed. The Bible talks about he bore our sins in his body on the tree that I might go free, that I might lay my head on my pillow tonight and close my eyes and know that if I wake up in the morning, it's a good thing. If I don't wake up in the morning, it's a better thing. And know the peace of God in my heart, my sins have been forgiven, the guilt is gone. 
problem. And I'm telling you, I'm not sure what you're going through tonight, but everybody could stop a little bit and give thanks unto the Lord for his unspeakable gift of his son to us. Miss Rebecca, you read the Romans 11, Hebrews 11. See, I told you, that's your brain, that's your brain on drugs, all right? We ought to thank God for providing his word for us that we can know the truth. We have folks today say, how do you know what's, which Bible to believe? How do you know what's true? Well, which one you're reading? How do you know what church to go to? Which one you're going to? You know, how do you know which Bible version to read? Which one are you reading? Usually people say that aren't reading anything. But I'm telling you, I can know. The Bible says in 1 John, these things were written that you may know. All right? You may, you may know him. You may know the Son of God. We may know that these things are true. We may know. And I'm telling you, just as if I'm standing here before you tonight, I believe God. I'm thankful to God for his word that I can know the truth. And the Bible doesn't say the truth will set you free. It says the truth will make you free. It'll, it'll, it'll make you into the image of Christ, a new creature. This Bible, after preaching uh, and starting a mission work for 15 years and watching folks come and get saved and watching God changed my life and their lives and, and watching us grow and mature. I'm telling you, the Bible is true. It works. It'll save your marriage. It'll save your children. What God says is right. Uh, I was talking a minute ago uh, to, to uh, uh, and, and Brother Chris and his wife and about the baby and she's staying home with the baby and we said family is what all that matters. You know where we learned that from? Not from the media. Not from the reality TV shows. You learn that from God. And at 47, going on 48 years of age, I'm telling you, I've driven some nice cars. I've had some nice motorcycles. I've had some nice sport bikes. Uh, uh, we've had nice dirt bikes. We've had uh, nice stuff. I have did some good things in my life. Uh, but I, there is absolutely nothing uh, like uh, knowing your sins are forgiven and knowing the truth and seeing God. It is real. God was right. Everything that he says was true. There's nothing more important than your marriage. There's nothing more important than your children. There's nothing more important than your church. There's nothing more important than your relationship with God. I'm telling you, thank God for his word where I can know these truths and find them to be true. Do you remember the Guyana Jim Jones cult? Y'all old enough to remember that? Drinking the Kool-Aid and committing mass suicide. You know that was a fundamentalist Christian group? That's what they'd call us, fundamentalist Christian group. We're not like them. Here's the difference. That it was a sergeant, an army sergeant that was in charge to go and clean up all the bodies, find them when they were ready to. And he was a Christian. And he says as he walked around that camp at Guyana, he said there's one thing he noticed about this Christian, this Christian fundamentalist camp. He never ever once saw a Bible. How could they have known Jim Jones wasn't really Jesus? Easily. How can I know that David Koresh is not really the Christ? It's easy to find out. How can I know of what's right and wrong and how we ought to? How can I know these things today? Listen, we can watch Dr. Phil and Oprah and, and discipline our kids and train them like they say, you know, or we can read our Bible and listen to what God says. We can, we can watch a reality show. What, who's these dumb girls, the Kardashians, you know? Uh, you know, Lord, I won't even get into that. Uh, you know, and it, you know, what are they? I, I, I've got some names for them, but you're not supposed say them in public and, and the world looks at them and all of our young girls go wow we want to be like them we want to be like them I've got an idea hit the fast forward button and give their life about 20 years and see where they're at find your Bible and do what God says and hit the fast forward button it just gets better he saves the best for last the Lord does and I'm telling you we ought to thank God for his word and, and love it and, and, and you keep memorizing it we ought to spread it everywhere that we go and tell people this if for no other reason than I we could give thanks to the Lord for the word of God uh, that I can know the truth and be made free in Christ and know for sure that if I died tonight, heaven would be my home. Give thanks unto the Lord. Secondly and quickly, call upon his name. One of the greatest privileges of a Christian is to be able to pray. If you'll go back through uh, uh, Jeremiah, the people of God had fallen so far away from God in idolatry and sin and God tells Jeremiah over and over again, go tell my people, by the way, that were worshiping idols, that were living in immorality and sin. God says, go tell my people that I long to do them good. 
I, the God of heaven, longs to answer their prayers. People say, why does God let these, you don't know the God of the Bible. I'm telling you tonight, the God of heaven longs to answer our prayers. He wants to hear us call upon his name. By the way, that name above every name, that at one day every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the name we're invoking when we pray. Uh, that's the name uh, we ought to understand and know. And, and uh, I'm, my name, my name, Boy, I'm really getting personal here. My name is Patrick V-O-N Vaughn Hall. I've gotten in more fights over my first and middle name in my young life than about anything. Because first of all, every day of school, when I grew up, the dumb teachers would say, Patricia, and some boy would laugh, and here we'd go. You know, we'd be on my name. Yeah, I'll show you, Patricia. You're going to go home and ask mama's going to say, how'd you get beat up by a boy named Patricia? You know, we, we'd go. And then, and then, you know, the Vaughn part. I've always, well, my kids have, you know, they're, they're crazy. My name was supposed to be V-A-U-G-H-N. And they spelled it wrong on the, on the, the uh, whatever the thing is you get when you have a birth certificate, all right? My kids, though, I've hated this name. All my, my children are fighting on who's going to name their child first, use that for a middle name. And I'm saying, man, don't do that to the poor kid. And they, they, they love the name. As a matter of fact, my son Brian is a cut up. And uh, he's a cut up. Uh, and, and I'm going to kill him one day. But anyhow, he's a cut up. He's 18. He said, I, I love it so much. He said, I'm going to get it tattooed right across my back on my shoulders. And, and, and uh, Vaughn, you know, Vaughn Hall, he said, I like that name. I said, listen, brother. I said, if you want to do something uh, for my name, don't tattoo it on your back. Live up to it and live for God and do what's right. And you know what the Bible, we're calling upon the name of the Lord. And, and the Bible says, you and I here tonight, if you have come here needy, if you have come here with a broken heart and a burdened heart and, and sorrows, and I'm telling you, we live in a hurtful world. There, we live in a world that people do wrong, there's sin rampant everywhere, and it is causing people to get hurt. Innocent people, some, most times we do it on ourselves, most times it's our own choice, but there's a lot of folks today that have never intended to get where they are. We've been deceived and lied to, and we find our lives in a mess. We find our lives destroyed. We find our hearts broken and, and trampled on by the devil and I'm telling you what God says tonight give him thanks but secondly call upon his name uh, ask him for help ask him for these things in our life there was a lady in a small town and everybody knew her as just a, almost as a homeless lady and she carried she was one that pushed a cart a, a grocery cart around all over town and and, and brought, I guess every town has somebody like that and would keep the trash in the cart. And she was just nasty and never, never bathed or anything. And she lived in a little shack on the outside of town with holes in the walls and, and just a rundown old place. And, and one day she died and they went to tear down the building. And as they pulled the wall, the, the, this is a true story, they pulled the, the boards off the walls, they found hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash stuffed in the house. She was a hoarder, you know, and, and, and of course, my, I don't know why I can't be kin to any of these kind of folks, but anyhow, they, they found hundreds of thousands of dollars there, and here's what the townspeople said. Why would she live so poor and so destitute and hungry and so nasty and such a terrible home and such bad conditions when she had hundreds of thousands of dollars at her disposal? We look at that and go, that's crazy, but let me ask you something, Christians, when our heavenly Father in heaven owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the Bible says. When our heavenly Father, God, who is all powerful, who is all knowing, who is all loving, that God of heaven looks at you and I in the eye and says, I long to do you good. You have not because you ask not. I, I want to answer your prayers. I want to be your father. Read the story of the prodigal son as that prodigal son leaves his father's home and spends his life in riotous living and, and blows it, winds up in the hog pen. Now, North Carolina, I can preach this harder because you ride around and smell the hog pen. Here, your, your cattle smell a little bit better than our hogs, I got to say, all right? And he lived. We grew up, we had a hog farm and I slopped those hogs and, and walk in that mud and muck is what, what they... 
they called it mud. I didn't believe it, you know, and it was just nasty. And I never looked at the slop that we fed those hogs and said, man, that looks good. I'd love to, I'd love to eat that for supper. This old boy had lived such a wretched life that he was so hungry, he looked at the slop of the hogs would be feeding off of and said he fade to fill his belly from the slop that the swine would. And we find him going back to his father. He said, I'm just going to go back and ask to be one of his hired servants. If he just, the hired servants at my father's house eat better than I do, I'm just going to ask him to let me keep the cattle or let me uh, sweep the, uh, the, the house or let me do something. And he finds out as he comes, there's his father up on the hill where he'd been waiting every evening. The Bible says that his father saw him afar off. The picture was every day, every afternoon, his father would leave the house and go up to the hill and, and look to see if his boy was coming home. And that's the love of the prodigal's father. And you and I tonight, you say, God wouldn't take somebody like me. You don't know God. Yeah, I bet in a service like this tonight, God's in heaven stopping and looking. The Bible says there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. God's not impressed by my tithe. God's not impressed by the money we put in the God's not impressed uh, with anything tonight. But one sinner, one person repents and turns to Christ. God says all the angels of heaven rejoice. And, 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 and what a joy it is in the presence of God's angels over one sinner. And I'm telling you tonight. Won't you call upon the name of the Lord? Ask him to forgive us. Won't you call upon the name of the Lord and ask him to help you? You say, well, I've prayed before. Well, do like the woman in the New Testament that she, she went to the king uh, and said, I need this. And he ignored her. And she went back again and went back again. And, and the Bible says for his importunity, which means she was bugging him, slapped to death. He finally said, okay, and gave in. And sometimes God wants us to want these things and to desire these things and call upon his name. Sometimes he's not going to answer our prayers till we get thankful for what he's already done. Or your kids like mine at Christmas time, they're watching TV and they want one of everything, every commercial. They're not prejudiced, they want one of everything. My kids say, Daddy, I want a new bicycle. I said, well, you go outside and pick that one up off the dirt and take care of it and we'll talk about getting you another bike. You all do that with your kids? Uh, hopefully that's a, a well, you know, you get thankful for what you got. We might get you something new. I wonder if God of heaven every once in a while goes, why would I answer your prayers? You not ever stop and give thanks for anything I've ever done for you before. And you know what the Bible says then? Make known his deeds among the people. You know what the world needs today? Some Christians to get up out of church and go out home and to work and elsewhere and when they're talking about, man, did you see that ball game last night? Man, we had a party last night, and it, we had such a good time, and we were drinking, and we were, and, and the Christian stops and says, well, let me tell you what happened to us last night. We went to church. Let me, let me tell you about this young girl that can recite. Let me tell you about the song. Let me, let me tell you about the, the, the fun time we had, fellowship. And let me tell you what God, let, we've been praying for brother so-and-so uh, to be healed. And he got, we've been praying for sister so-and-so's husband and he got saved. We've been praying for this to happen and God answered our prayer. And the world needs some Christians. By the way, you know what a witness is? It's somebody that tells what they've seen. And I just wonder if we got thankful and grateful to God for all that he's done, we begin to call on his name and ask him in prayer and beg God to do great things. And God begin to answer our prayers and we begin to go tell others what God has done and tell others what the Lord has done. And they begin to hear that God does answer prayer. Maybe there's some hope for an old sinner like me. Hey, if that Pat Hall fellow can get saved, if that old heroin addict can get saved, if that old drug addict or drunkard or that good man can get saved, maybe there's hope for me. I wonder if it would stir people's hearts and make them want to come into church and be around a place like that where God answers prayer and around thankful, happy people. When I first went to Wilmington, if you don't take the left at the Krispy Kreme, by the way, if the hot and now signs on, you, you can go ahead and stop and bring some with you when you come, all right? And, and uh, if you go another half mile to the right, it's a church called Southside Baptist Church. When I first moved to town, they were without a pastor, and they had what they called an older gentleman who had come in and filling in as the interim pastor. We had a business meeting on a Wednesday night. During the business meeting, that man got up to begin to start the business of the church. 
One of the deacons got angry at him because he didn't pray before they started the meeting and actually got up and walked up to the pulpit and took a swing at the interim pastor. I'm talking about a 60 something year old retired fellow. This is a true story. And now I want to ask you something. What do you think everybody in town thought about that? What do you think about the guys down at the bar room that got in a fight last Friday night and I invite them to church so you can see the deacon take a swing at the interim pastor at our church? I wonder when we, do y'all remember the first time I remember where I was when we heard about Jim Baker and Jimmy Swaggart and all these preachers that I remember, I just answered a call to preach and I had a hard time telling folks I was a preacher because it used to be you said you're a preacher, they knew how you lived and then it got to be to the point that they wondered what was going on. I wonder if we uh, begin to get a, God's power on our lives again and folks begin to hear uh, that something's going on down there and it's not crazy or it's not meanness or it's not, I wonder if they'd get a desire to want to be, that's what revival is. That all the great revivals that ever begin usually didn't begin with the big church most of the great revivals begin with two little old ladies that begin to pray for revival for God to come down. There's a revival on the island of Lewis, the Lewis Islands. Did I, did I give you all that? There's a video you can watch of a lady who gives a first count, first-hand account of the revival on the island of Lewis. And I've, I've, I've now... Uh, read the book that the preacher that came, the preacher revival has written. Uh, I've now, you can go to uh, sermonaudio.com and get a guy, his name's Duncan Campbell, and you can hear him preach, and you can hear his account of the revival that took place in 1950 on some uh, uh, islands off of Scotland and Ireland, the islands of Lewis, a revival, a true heaven sent revival that took place. It began with two little old ladies. One of them was blind, I think. One of them's name was Bella. And they were trying to build the church up. They were having youth activities and doing all these things. And, and, and those ladies called the preacher to their house and said, Preacher, y'all are trying to have revival down there at that church. Do so y'all want revival? The preacher said, Yes, we do. You and the deacons, she said, that every Tuesday night and every Friday night from 10 o'clock at night to 5 o'clock in the morning, me and my sister Bella are going to pray. And we want you men of the church to pray. And they begin to pray every Tuesday night and Friday night from 10 o'clock in the morning till five o'clock or 10 o'clock at night till five o'clock in the morning. And I think it was about six months and they were in an old broken down church on those islands with the cold and it's winter time. And, and one night, one of the deacons stood up and said, he held his hands up and they say, Duncan Campbell and the ladies and the testimonies of numerous people say, that deacon stood up and held his hands up and says, oh God, how can we have revival when our own hands are dirty? We have sin in our own lives. And they said the building, they say, I'm telling you, the building shook. And they began to pray. And later in the evening, as they opened the doors of the church, they could see fires coming from all over the island. The revival had broken out. There would be dance halls. And all of a sudden, at 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning, in the middle of the dance, somebody would fall down on the floor and begin to cry. And they'd say, oh my, the revival has come and they would spread, and people would go to the meetings. They would last on into two and three and four o'clock in the morning. The revival lasted for three years. The revival produced preachers and missionaries, and, and people got saved, and lives were changed. It was genuine. It wasn't a show. Uh, it wasn't, uh, let's crank up the music. Uh, it wasn't, uh, when you read Duncan Campbell, he, he said, it was not my sermon. It was God's people began to pray, and people began to see what God was doing, and God began to move, and a great revival took place, and you say, what would revival mean? It meant folks were going to heaven. Uh, it meant good things were happening. A wonderful place uh, there with the revival take place. And I just wonder tonight if a few of us decided we're going to give thanks unto the Lord. And when's the last time you knelt around an altar and just said, Lord, thank you. Where would I be tonight if I had not gotten saved? Where would I be tonight if this church had not come into town? Where would I be tonight without the Bible and knowing? Where would I be tonight without God's love for me and for you? You say, well, I'm not a Christian. Where would you be tonight? You've not, the danger of, of being an unbeliever is God's worked in your life and saved you and protected you all your life and we've never even acknowledged it. When I was a sinner, I thought I was big and bad and nobody could hurt me or bother me. I could go as fast as I want to do what I wanted to. I couldn't die when my dumb self, my mom and dad were praying for my safety is what kept me alive. Give thanks unto the Lord. Tonight, you got a burden. 
I don't care what it is. I don't see anywhere in scripture where God's bothered by anything we ask of him. If it's not his will, he's just not going to answer it. He's going to say no. My wife taught me that in children's church. God always answers our prayers. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And then I wonder, as we got up off the altar, and go through revivals, and God begins to answer our prayers. And we went back to work, and, and, and people saw that we were grateful. You know, people, I don't know about where y'all at, but people just gripe and grumble, and everything's so bad all the time. And there are those days. But I'm telling you, God's good, too. I'm going to go home tomorrow night for one reason. Actually, two. One of them's named Taylor Grace, and she's a six-month-old little baby girl. The other one's name is Jaron, uh, Michael Jaron. That's my, my Bethy's uh, little boy. He's uh, 16 months old, and she's coming in tomorrow night. So that answer, that settled that. Uh, that's, uh, I'm, and so I, they're going to spend two or three days with me. And I don't know about y'all, but I was holding Taylor the other day. We were watching Bonanza. Remember, we are training up a child the way she's going, watching Gunsmoke, and sitting in our chair, and she likes me better than all the rest of them, you know, and all the rest of the family and stuff. And I was kissing on her and loving on her, and, and she even likes to hear me sing. I sing to her, and, and, and she won't go to sleep until I sing to her, and she'll sing back to me. And we just fellowship there in the chair, and, and I got overwhelmed with the thought of, I wondered if my old lineman daddy, who's in heaven now, by the way, who got saved at Christmas time. Brother, they were putting up the Christmas lights in our hometown. I don't know if y'all still do that. And those two men in the, who worked with Daddy were Christians, and the preacher come by, and Mom and my brother and I left home. And uh, that preacher said, uh, by the way, my dad's name was Buell Samuel Hall. His nickname was Snake. He was a city boy. I'm just kidding. His nickname was Snake. Less than third grade education. That preacher said, Snake, you need to give your life to Jesus. He said, I'll come to church Sunday. And thank God for that preacher who said, you may die between now and Sunday. And they knelt down in Walterboro, South Carolina on Main Street in my hometown. Three, the preacher, two men, and my daddy. And my daddy gave his heart and life to Jesus Christ. I wonder, in heaven, does he get to see Taylor? Who's now living in a Christian home. My children, who never saw me drink and cuss and fight and live like the devil, were raised in a Christian home. They were loved by, I, I wonder, and now David's married a fine Christian girl, and, and they, they've got that little baby in a Christian home, and they're, they're reading Bible stories to her, and, and Jaron's going to come, and my Bethy married a fine young uh, preacher's son, and, and they love the Lord. That, they've been in church ever since the day he was, he, he was born. Uh, they, he's, you know, they, they, he, he's in Sunday school. He, they get to sing to him. He gets to hear about Jesus and know love and just happy. And, and see, they never know the anger and the hatred of the drunkenness and the meanness that I knew because of his decision. And when I go through that, I'm telling you, how could I not praise him forever? Why could I not tell folks that and look everybody in the eye here tonight and say, God can forgive you, he forgave me. God can change you. And, and listen, here's what, when the demoniac met Jesus and Jesus cast the demons out of him, he said, I want to go be with you, Lord Jesus. And Jesus said, no, go home to your friends and tell them the great things that God has done for you. That's what he wanted him to do. I want to do you, I want you to ask you something tonight. You want to join me around the altar and say, thank you, Lord? Where would I be had my daddy not made that decision? He had no idea in the influence he had on my life. Them little baby girls are in a Christian home, and my son and got a new, another grandbaby girl on the way. What joy that is and the goodness of God. I could thank him and praise him forever. I, I wonder if you're here tonight and you just got a burden. Don't carry it anymore, please. Wouldn't it be a shame to come with a burden and, and leave with the same thing when God of heaven says, won't you come and, and lay that burden on me and let me share it with you? And then I wonder if you'd make me a promise. If God answers your prayer, does the work in your heart, you'll go out and you'll tell somebody. You go out and tell somebody what God's done for you and, and, and wherever you go. And, and I just think, I just think that's, what, that's what church is. And I wonder if we told God about his good deeds, the whole world about his good deeds, I wonder if he'd answer more of our prayers. If he answered, and I wonder if we were thankful to God, would he answer more of our prayers? Let's pray tonight. And dear Father, I pray that each one of us, as we stop, 
I pray the Lord Jesus, you've already spoken to our hearts. Nothing I can say now. If we do not know the joy of sins forgiven, may we come receive Christ who died and suffered on the cruel cross for our sins that we might receive the grace, the mercy, undeserved, unmerited favor of God and forgiveness of our sins, the peace of God that passeth all understanding, our names written in the Lamb's book of life of heaven. I pray, dear God, we'd come and say, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Please forgive me of my sins. I pray that as Christians, has it been some time since we've just said, name some things we're just thankful for. I'm thankful for my wife. I'm thankful for my children. Thankful, God, for your daily provisions in my life. I wonder, Lord, if there's somebody here tonight with a heavy burden and a broken heart, they'd come and call upon the name above all names of Jesus. And, Lord, invoke that great name and say, Dear Lord Jesus, please hear my prayers tonight. Then I pray, Lord, we promise you, we promise ourselves that we're going to go tell somebody what God's done in our life. Everybody can be a witness if we're saved. We can tell somebody what God has done in our lives. Please help us tonight, oh Lord. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand, please? Heads bowed, eyes closed. We're going to have what's called an invitation. If you'd like to come and give thanks, bring your burdens to the Lord. Why don't you come tonight as we sing? Why don't you come and talk to the Lord? Have thine own way. How long has it been since you've come and just said, Lord, thank you for all you've done in my life? Did you come tonight with a burden? Broken heart, a need? Would you ask God to help you? If you'd like to come tonight and receive the forgiveness of sins, call upon the name of the Lord. I'd ask you to come. He loves us, died for us. Give his life on the cross for us, won't you come? How about it? Thank you, Lord. Lord, I'm in need tonight. My heart's broken in need. If you'd like somebody to pray with you, pastor's here, I'm here, we'd be glad to. Won't you come? It's just saying, Lord, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for offering yourself for my sins. Thank you, Lord. I believe, trust in you, forgive me of my sins. There'll be one more verse after this and that'll be our last. What about you? Please don't leave with a burden. Would God's give all of heaven and earth just for you and I? Thank you, Brother Chris. Our piano is just going to play through this last verse here. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I've got a broken heart tonight and a heavy burden. And I need you to answer my prayers. Won't you come and bring it to the Lord tonight and give it to him. Don't bear it by yourself. Lord, I promise I'll tell somebody what God's done for me. I'll be a witness. Anyone else you need to come. way. Great message tonight, amen. Just not thankful enough, are we?
I'm going to ask Brother Pat, if he would, to uh, make his way back to the back door and give you a chance to uh, speak to him on the way out tonight. Be much in prayer for the services in the morning. Be here if you can in the morning. And um, if you'd like to talk with someone before you leave here tonight, we'd be glad to take the time to do that. Settle things in your heart before God. And it's so important that you settle things while God is speaking. If you'd like to talk to us, we'd love to do that. Well, let's bow our heads with a word of prayer. Be careful going home tonight. And uh, look forward to meeting again, uh, together again uh, in the morning. I'll ask Brother Harry if he would dismiss us in prayer, please.